So before I get started this morning, even before I read scripture, I want to uh, share just a quick word about our youth group. Uh, our youth group, many of them are, are not here uh, with us today because they are in Columbia. They've been in Columbia since Friday uh, at an event called Revolution, which is a, a youth gathering that uh, has occurred for the last... Mary, when was the first time y'all went? Five years ago? You didn't go the first time? It was five years ago, because uh, I've been here for, this is my fourth time around. Um, make sure those are off. Okay, yeah. Um, this is uh, the fifth year that they've done it. Uh, here's our group right here. Uh, we were gathered on the State House steps yesterday. They did a, uh, a State House scavenger hunt that I put together for them and had them running all around. Um, you got to know this. Good luck keeping up with them when they come back. Because uh, those kids have been set on fire for God this weekend. Uh, it is the best conference I have ever been to. I've been doing this for a long time as a youth. Probably close to 30 years I've been doing youth stuff in this conference. And Romal, Romal Toon, the guy who came and spoke to them, just lit them up in some amazing ways. I, I just want, I, I sat and took notes. I told the kids that they couldn't have their phones out and then I sat there the whole time and I, I was taking notes on my phone because, I mean, he, he was on fire. Um, and, and it didn't hurt that, that he's a Duke grad. Um, <laughs> so there's some good stuff right there. He, I missed him by a year or a year and a half. He was, he was gone before I um, before I got there, he would have gradu- He would have been there around the same time as Chris was. But um, it, it, this was this was an amazing thing. He, this, let me just give you a few of his his little lines here. He said, "When you, uh, it's never too late to change. There's, it's never too late to change, uh, no matter what you've done in the past." He says, "Some people do things in order to have people notice and care about them." And he offered the kids, he's talking to youth here, he offered the kids validation versus confirmation. He said validation comes from others. And that's what we seek all the time in our lives is to be validated by what other people think about it. He said, but confirmation comes from God. That you walk out every single morning and you are enough because you are the way God created you to be. He says sometimes we do unhealthy things just so we can be validated. He said, never, this, this was, I tweeted these two things yesterday. Never, which I wasn't supposed to do because I was like in the thing. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm tweeting that out. Never try to prove the people wrong who hurt you. Instead, try to prove the people right who love you. Your youth are hearing this. The youth of this church right now are hearing, this was yesterday. So I saw two sessions. I saw Friday nights and Saturday mornings. I left before last night's session and John McCall texted me this morning. He said, Brad, you missed the best one yet. It's like, come on, man. <laughs> and this was, this was, a, he said, own who you are in Christ so you can limit your mistakes and maximize your miracles. I mean, I, I'm done. Like, I don't even have to preach my sermon. I could just sort of move on and, 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 and those words alone. And the kids just, all weekend long, were just hearing these words over and over and over again. Uh, they were confirmed and affirmed and, and everything in between. Uh, Cindy sent me a text this morning saying that, that nearly every single one of them last night made a response to the altar call. Because they always do an altar call in, in that moment of, of coming down and making, making a commitment, a change. And some, for some youth, it's the first time they're doing it. For the, some youth, it's the first time they're taking it serious. For some of us, it's reconfir- reconfirming what we've already done. I mean, it's an amazing, amazing thing that is happening in Colombia. And I'm proud of our conference for bringing uh, Ramal in and, and allowing him to, to do his thing. So um, get ready for when they come back because it's going to be awesome. Um, they're already good kids. Uh, they just need a little bit of encouragement in the right direction. And, and, and you guys enabled them to, to, to do that, to be there uh, this weekend. And so thank you for that. They stayed in a, a nice house and it was a whole group. I mean, that's, that's a big crew right there. 
uh, and they, they just did a fantastic job. So uh, pray for them as they come back, and the next time you see any of them, uh, ask them how it went, uh, and see, just, just see, when you ask them that question, just see if their eyes don't light up. Uh, just see if, if, you, if you don't notice a little bit of a change in some of those kids that you've watched since here and they've drawn you cr- driven you crazy because they've been run up and down these halls like my children do every single Sunday or sit over here and they talk really loud during the service and you get upset. Listen, th- that, what those kids are doing now, uh, th- I have great hope for our future. A lot of people don't. I have great hope um, because of what I'm seeing in our young people. I got great hope for our present because I see a lot of beautiful faces here today. So let me get back in and and actually preach the sermon I prepared because that was not one um, that I worked on ahead of time. So um, we're in the Gospel of Luke um, this morning, Luke chapter 4, 21 through 30. And here's what you need to know. So you've already heard the the 1 Corinthians passage. Uh, This is the Luke passage, and so both of these were chosen for this particular day uh, back in 1978. Because these are lectionary passages. And so maybe those people who put the lectionary together, they knew that this would be a fifth Sunday uh, down in 20... What year? It's 2016. And so, therefore, this would be words that that a a joint congregation that was coming together needed to hear. Um, Or maybe God just works in ways that are beyond my understanding, which is probably more the case. All right? So, so hear this word uh, from Luke's gospel. Then he began to say to them, let me get my, right, let me back up. You got to know where he is. Jesus is in Nazareth. He's in his hometown. He has just for the first time stood up and sort of preached a little bit. He, he opened the scroll and he read from Isaiah and he said, today this scripture has been fulfilled. This is what he's getting ready to say. And, and so he's in his hometown. Keep that in mind. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your, in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you do that you did in Capernaum. And he said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the, home, or in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to the widow of Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all the synagogue was filled with rage, and they got up and drove him out of the town and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through their midst, and he went on his way. May God add God's blessing to the reading, to the hearing, and to the understanding of God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Amen. So remember, this was the community that Jesus grew up in. All right, this he's Joseph's son. He's the carpenter's son. He these people know and love him. Um, some of you know that I wasn't here last week because I was in my home church uh, baptizing my nephew. So I got to go back and be with the people who uh, helped to raise me. And, and friends, those people still love me. They are proud of who I have become. And, and this one lady walked up to me and like introduced herself for what she thought I guess was the first time. I, I knew her because she was my math teacher. So Miss Fran Juan comes walking up to me and, and she goes, you may not remember me. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, I do. You were the worst and hardest math teacher I ever ever had. <laughs> like I didn't say that to her, but I'm thinking it. I'm like seventh grade, I'm scarred. Of course I know who you are. But you could tell she was proud, not because I remembered her math lessons, because she was a part of the church. It had raised me up and that had loved upon me. She was a part of that community. 
That's what a community is supposed to do. That's what our task is when we gather together. We're a small piece of, like I shared in the puzzle with the kids, we're a part of something bigger than ourselves. And there's no other way of knowing that other than raising up our young people in order to understand God's love in their lives. And I would hope that that's what Nazareth did for Jesus. I mean, surely Joseph and and Mary had their parts to play and to raise up and to teach Jesus. Uh, He was human after all. He had to be raised up. He had to be trained. And you can tell that they were really sort of impressed by Jesus. I mean, they were sort of shocked. That's what the text tells us. They were, what does it say? They, they began, he began, to, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came out of his mouth. You can feel that, right? You can feel that. Some of you have experienced that before. You've gone back somewhere and, or, or you've had somebody come back to you and in, into your community. You've been proud of them. Man, you celebrate them. So that's what they were doing for that one verse. Because then the next second, they go to throw him off a cliff. Like, that didn't last very long, did it? Like, we're really proud of you. And Jesus says, I know you are. And let me tell you something more. And they literally take him to a cliff to throw him off. I've been there. It's called the Precipice of Nazareth. I've got a couple of pictures for you here. Um, we, we went a few years back um, to, this, to this space of, of where it was. This is outside of Nazareth. And this is the, uh, the hill that overlooks the valley that's down there. This is where the, the marking is of exactly the spot of where they, they think that they attempted to, to throw Jesus off. There's, there's a second picture. We got really close to the edge. My friend Joe and I were, were sort of really, really close to the edge and everybody's freaking out so um and then the next picture you can see in the back left there's a, a rise and so this next picture is that's looking out across to mount Tabor. Uh, there from Nazareth, from the precipice. And, and we're going to talk all about Mount Tabor next week. So you got to come back and hear that sermon. Because um, that's where the transfiguration occurred. And we're talking all about transfiguration next week. So um, back at our regular schedule, uh, come back to hear that sermon. So, so Jesus is there in Nazareth. And, 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 and he has this teaching that really sort of makes the scripture come alive in these folks' lives. Like, like he, he calls them back to the time in, in which there were prophets Elijah and Elisha, and he points out to the people who are hearing, mostly Jews, probably all the Jews at this point, he points out to the Jews that are listening that, that these texts teach us that God, well, God's not kept in a box. That God loves other people just as much as God loves you. That in fact, God loves the Gentiles just as much as God loves the Jews. Now this was not popular news, friends. This is what drove drove the the people to get so enraged and infuriated that they, they attempt to sort of drag him up to the cliff and toss him off because he challenged their preconceived notions of who God was in the world around them. He refers to the widow at Zarephath and Sidon. He refers to Naaman the Syrian. Both of these were all outsiders. They weren't included in the big scheme of things as far as these folks were concerned. These were outside of God's people. But yet, Jesus points to the fact that they were included by God, and if God's going to include him, then we have no place, no right, no ability to exclude him. None. That they get to share in the benefits of God's love that at one point in time they were excluded from. See, friends, the the community is implied in this story. That's what Jesus is hitting at, is that your community is expanding, friends. Because think about this. The widow, what does the widow lack? I mean, we, we point out the fact that she's a Gentile, so she's not a Jew. But not only was she not a Jew, she was also a widow, which means that she'd lost her husband, which means she was sort of outside looking in on a very patriarchal society. A society that was based very dominantly on the men's perspective. 
And so if she didn't have a man, then she was sort of outside looking in. That's what's implied here. Not the fact that she's not a Jew, it's the fact that she's, she's sort of poor, a poor widow. And then Naaman the, the Syrian, which is a nice way of saying it, because most of the time when we read it, we call him Naaman the leper. And so he had a skin disease. And so he's outside the community because people with skin diseases don't get an inside seat. Right? We're going to keep them outside because back then they didn't understand things. They didn't know how things were transmitted. So they were forcing lepers to go to live outside of the community. These two people, outsiders looking in, are included in Jesus' vision for who we are supposed to be as the church. Listen, this is easy to say. It's really easy to say that God is for them. We can look out at a world of which a lot of people who we question, we go, yeah, God, God is for them. Because that doesn't threaten us in any way. God's for them as long as they stay outside. God can be with them outside. Instead, we have to see ourselves. We have to see ourselves in our community as a place that receives others in just like God. Just like God. So the gospel reminds us that our community is made up of those also that are included from the outside. But our first reading, which is the reason we, we chose it's lectionary, but our first reading reminds us what the community is based upon anyways. So let's go back to that love chapter that Barb read to us. Because most of you, some of you actually had this read at your wedding. I'm, I'm going to break the news to you and I hope this doesn't hurt your feelings. Paul didn't write this for your wedding. Paul didn't write this for a wedding. See, we have to keep it in context. What did Paul was writing about? So if you go back to the church at Corinth, this church was struggling. Churches don't do that, do they? They were divided. Oh, here we go. They were struggling to find peace within that new framework of a community growing together. See, earlier in his letter, Paul warns against division. He tells the church, some of you say that I belong to Paul. Some of you say I belong to, to Apollos. I belong to Cephas. I belong here and there. And he says, no, the fact is you all belong to Christ. And then he spends about seven or eight chapters trying to break this down for them. And he says that the church is, is filled, your church is filled with people who have amazing gifts and, and talents. And not all of those talents, is, talents are the same. Some of them are, are a little bit more here and a little bit more there. And, and you've got this and you do that. And, and all of this sort of comes to a culmination in chapter, the end of chapter 12. And, and listen, this is the way chapter 12 ends. He's talking all about the gifts and the talents and the ways in which the, the church is made up of so many amazing people. And he ends chapter 12 and he says but strive for the greater good and I will show you still a more excellent way you got plenty of talent you can do amazing things you yourself were created you're a piece of the puzzle but I'm still going to show you a more amazing way and then he teaches us about love then he teaches us about love. So he celebrates them. I celebrate you. You have an amazing gifts. You have amazing talents. You are unique as God created you to be. You're amazing. You're amazing. You're amazing. And then he says, but if I, he turns it in on himself. We're not accusatory here. We're going to turn it in on ourselves. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and angels, but do not have love. If I have the prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith as to move mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give away all my possessions, I'm generous beyond belief. If I hand my body over so that I may boast, 
but do not have love. I'm nothing. We're nothing without love. Friends, we have our differences. We may choose to worship in a different way. We may choose the different ways in which we live out our lives as faithful people. We may be blessed with different gifts, and, and there's a variety of gifts in this very room. And, and, and we may deal with challenges that come our way. We may parent different styles. We may decide to, to do different things and to support different ministries. And we may be a part of all the different kind of things that we have going on in the life of the church. But if we don't have love, if you and I don't have love that is first found in God, we're clanging symbols. I think about that little, the little thing that you wind up that's like the monkey, like clapping. Like how annoying is that thing? And that's sort of what we're like to God. When we get so caught up in the ways in which I have to do everything my way, this is all about me. Yeah, God celebrates you. God says you are amazing. I created you. God created you. That's amazing enough. But when that ego that we have turns in on ourselves and we start thinking, oh, but this, I don't like this way of doing things. Or I choose to support this ministry and not that. When it all becomes about us, that's where the danger lies. Now let me say a quick word. Because there's a few people here thinking, some people are in here thinking, man, I really wish such and such was here to hear this sermon. <laughs> you can't control such and such. You can't respond for such and such. In, a, in, a, in an ironic sort of twist, this is about you right now. Where you find yourself in the life of our church. Or in the life of any church. If you're visiting with us from outside, any community of faith that you call your own. Or our place in the bigger structure. The church with a capital C. And this is about the role and the ways in which we are called to love. We wrestled with sort of a bulletin cover for today, and, and I actually purchased this print. This print came out after the, the shooting down at Emmanuel Church, and, and I, this, I felt, was just sort of perfect. This embodies what I wanted us to, to think about. And so um, I love that passage. I didn't, we didn't choose to preach on this, but, but this for me, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you have, you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them together, all together in perfect unity. I've said this for a couple of times now, and we complicate things tremendously in our lives. Let me simplify it. Just love the people in front of you. That's it. That's it. You can memorize this whole thing. But if you're not loving the people in front of you, I can't help you. Love the people in front of you. Amen? Really? Amen? Amen. Thank you.